able to some of us be here in person some of us worshiping online I'm glad that we are continuing to reach out into our world I noticed that last week we had over 600 views on Facebook alone I'm grateful for the ways in which this service is reaching other people and you have made that possible with your prayers and your support and we are grateful for that I do call your attention just a few announcements one is that we need to make sure that you know that very soon we're going to have the uh, quartet music and it'll be out ready to go and you'll be able to enjoy it on YouTube the way we've enjoyed Miss Elsie's. I think we're up to about 270 views uh, now on Miss Elsie's uh, piano uh, playing and uh, she is making the world better by, by hearing her uh, piano play. I am grateful for that. I'm grateful for our deacons who are going to meet this afternoon at about 12 15 and then our we will have our session meeting on Tuesday night we have other things going on in the life of the church and we want you to know about them I was told today that um, the Elks Club is going to have a flag day presentation at 2 o'clock you're certainly welcome to be a part of that I'm grateful for those who made possible the top 10 percent banquet today uh, this past week and for those who are graduating, we want to be in prayer for those. There are a lot of things going on in the life of our church and more getting ready to happen. And I hope that you'll stay open and hear what is going on and be in prayer or participate wherever you can. It's uh, great to have our newest member, Patty Jaeger, that is here with us. And uh, she uh, joined last Sunday. Good to have her and our new uh, Bob Lane, our first Bob Lane scholarship recipient, uh, Luce Morales, who you saw out in the narthex, and she is uh, very excited about that, and I appreciate the work of the committee on that, on that difficult project, it really was. We're glad that you're here. Let us stand together as we are able, and let us sing all hail the power of Jesus' name.
Let us pray. We do crown you, O Lord, King of our lives. You have made the whole world, and you love us too. We thank you for each and every gift that you give us in this life, for creation, for friends and family, for all the many ways in which you give us your church and the gathering together. We thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for a chance to be in tune with your spirit once again with one another. And we thank you that you are with us whether we're here or whether we're at home, whether we're around the world or we're right here in Marshall. We thank you that you are always and promise always to be with us. And we pray to you because Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Meeting God can be a very disturbing experience, for, for God may require of us changes that we fear. We may hear challenges that push us beyond our comfort zones. In our prayers of confession, we seek to overcome our resistance to God's direction and open ourselves to greater possibilities. Let us pray this prayer together. God, we often fail to recognize that you are always with us. We are the ungodly ones who deny your love by our failure to love. We deny your law by our failure to live by it. We laugh at your promises. We appear more burdened than joyful in the midst of the wondrous gift of life. We seldom pause to give thanks. The compassion of Christ finds little echo in us who claim to be Christians. We need your forgiveness, O oh God, and a new birth. Amen. <coughs> Hear these words of comfort. God favors, God fav, God's favor rests on us. Sincere confession is met with caring acceptance. God hears the prayers of our hearts and grants us peace the world cannot give. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, that we might have access to grace to the grace in which we stand. Lift up the cup of salvation and offer sacrifices of thanksgiving. God has loosed our bonds and freed us to share God's glory. Now join us, if you will, in singing number 739, Pass It On.
Today we're talking about Jesus calling his 12 disciples. When I was a little bit younger, I learned the song of the 12 apostles, and it goes like this. Jesus called them one by one, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Next came Philip, Thomas, too, Matthew, and Bartholomew. Yes, Jesus called them. Yes, Jesus called them. Yes, Jesus called them. He called them one by one. James, the one they call the less. Simon, also Thaddeus, the twelve apostles Judas made. Jesus was by him betrayed. Yes, Jesus called them. Yes, Jesus called them. Yes, Jesus called them. He called them one by one. When I learned that song, I finally knew all the 12 apostles. It wasn't until I learned that song. I could look them up. I could find them. And of course, if you compare the different uh, stories and uh, calling in the different gospels and also in the book of Acts, you see all the list of the apostles. Uh, there are four different lists throughout the, the Gospels and Acts. And in some of those lists, they're in a little bit different order, but for the most part, they're the same. Uh, some of the names, we feel like the people had more than one name that they went by. But the 12 apostles helped to Jesus, and Jesus called them, and he sent them on missions. He asked them to go and do what he does, to help people, to share the good news, to heal people, to do whatever it is that Jesus did to do it for them. When we are asked to be disciples, it means that we want to be students of Jesus. We want to be followers, and we want to do what he does. Let's ask him to help us do that. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the fact that you call us, that you include us in your work, that you trust us to share your good news with the world. And because of that, it's a pretty big responsibility because so many people need to hear your good news. Help us to be your disciples. Bless the children of our church when we cannot be together. We pray that you would help us to be together in spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In sharing our prayer concerns, I wanted us to, I was sharing at the first service that Mr. Chuck Abma was able to come back to Marshall Manor West. I just got a text from Paul Martin saying that he is having breathing problems again and is back in Longview Hospital. So we ask for you to remember Mr. Chuck Abma in your prayers, if you will. Continue to remember Ms. Peggy Spencer, Mr. Laura O'Neill, who have had falls, recovering from those we, uh, in surgeries. We also know that there are situations that uh, in our world, the unrest that we see uh, all around us, we certainly realize that the world needs Jesus. The world needs to turn to God, and we hope that in all of these things, we will live like Jesus wants us to live, and we will pray that others will come to God. I hope that uh, you will remember all of this, remember your church and your prayers, if you will, and all of us as we are doing the work of God throughout the week. Let us pray. You, O oh Lord, are gracious, and you are trusting, and you have been good to us from the very beginning. We pray that we might respond to your call, be disciples and as part of that we would care like you care that we would care about those who are hurting and those who are grieving and those we realize that the grieving does not stop in just a day or two but it goes on for sometimes many years I pray oh God that you would help us to be compassionate that we would be sensitive to the needs of those around us even when they're not our needs that you would help us to be loving to those who need to experience love in a way that they've never experienced. Well, God, you have shown us 
that your way is the best way. And we pray that we might be able to reach other people with your good news. The opportunities that you have for us to reach those who are struggling with their finances, those that are struggling with mental illness, those that are emotionally disturbed, Lord, for the dissatisfaction in life that so many people have, we pray that we might be instruments of your peace in a world of turmoil. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving. We hope that you will continue to do that because there is work now, there has been work going on, and there will be work in the future that needs to be done for the cause of Christ and for God's kingdom. What shall we return to God for all the bounty we have received? Everything we have comes from God and is but lent to us for a time. Let us offer a thanksgiving sacrifice rejoicing in the opportunity to share in bringing in the harvest for God. Let us again pray. Help us, O oh Lord, to be good stewards of what you have given us, and may we return to you what you deserve. And we pray, O oh God, that in all of this, it will be used for the advancement of your kingdom, that we may serve like you serve, that our mission may be your mission. For we pray in Jesus' name.
know, the choir is back in action and how wonderful it is to have you here. I appreciate the music at this service all the time and I appreciate the choir and what they do. I wanted to read to you today a passage that begins in Matthew chapter 9 and goes to, begins in chapter, in verse 35 of chapter 9 and then goes into chapter 10, the first eight verses. Matthew chapter 9, begin with the 35th verse and going through the 8th verse of the next. This is a transition passage, these first three verses, between the first section of Matthew and the second section of Matthew. Hear the word of God. Jesus went around visiting all the towns and villages. He taught in the synagogues, preached the good news about the kingdom, and helped people with every kind of disease and sickness. As he saw the crowds, his heart was filled with pity for them, because they were worried and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And so they said to his disciples, The harvest is large, but there are few workers to gather it in. Pray to the owner of the harvest that he will send out workers to gather in his harvest. Jesus called his twelve disciples together and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James and his brother John, the sons of Zebedee, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Patriot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. These twelve men were sent out by Jesus with the following instructions. Do not go to any Gentile territory or any Samaritan towns. Instead, you are to go to those lost sheep, the people of Israel. Go and preach. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. Bring the dead back to life. Heal those who suffer from dreaded skin diseases and drive out demons. You have received without paying, so give without being paid. Word of God for the people of God. As we approach this time of year, it is a time where in normal times we begin our nominating process. We just begin to nominate, put the nominating committee together and we put them together so that they can nominate deacons and elders for the coming year. We have nine elders and nine deacons on active in, serving in those in the diaconate and the session and we rotate, we are on the rotation system so every year we rotate three people off and three new ones on. And I began thinking about that and I began thinking about how that is going on and it gets harder and harder every year to find people who agree to serve and then beyond that we have had our committee system all but collapse and we have tried to find different and new ways in which to gather people to do the work from time to time. Most of it gets done. Occasionally some things would have been better done in the previous system but in all of this we need to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will give us the workers because no matter what we do, what we call it, how we organize, there's going to be a need for people to respond. The other thing I began thinking about, and it's a problem in our denomination, but in many denominations, if your son or daughter came to you in years past or now and said, God is calling me to become a minister, would you be encouraging or discouraging if they came to you with that. And I say that in all honesty. I'm not sure how the ministry is perceived in the world today, but I will say this, there are fewer and fewer younger people that are responding to the call to ministry. And in beyond that, there are more and more people who are second and third careers. People, the average age of the people in a seminary is 50 years of age. This is concerning because when you look at the world and the churches are always going to need ministers and pastors they're going to need people that are caring for them and teaching them and preaching to them the good news 
There's going to be a need for these in the future. And when we look at our presbytery, most of the pastors are approaching retirement. It's an amazingly frightful, and yet at the same time, I trust that God has a plan. We just don't always respond to his plan. But Jesus here in this passage is calling his apostles. He has already called them together, and now the list is here, and he's sending them out on a mission. And I think it's important for us to see this because everybody isn't called to be an apostle. Everybody isn't called to be a deacon or an elder or a pastor. But we are all called to do something in the kingdom of God. And so because of that, we all have a job to do. And we can't sit back and we can't be slackers. Are we disciples of Jesus Christ or not? God wants us to be. He wants us to come back to him and serve with him. And the world needs people sharing the good news. I'm convinced of that every time I watch the news, but more and more each and every day, the world needs to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. The first thing is, is that Jesus was on a mission. Jesus was on a mission. And his mission was to come down from heaven to earth to share the good news that God loves them and he wants to be in relationship with them. And he wants to forgive us for the things that separate us from God. And in all of that, we begin to see how much and how important it is to realize that Jesus went out. He went out from heaven. He went into the towns and villages. He went and shared the good news to people. He didn't say, come to Nazareth, that's the only place where God is, and you must come here today. That's not the way Jesus did it. He made sure that as he was reaching out, he made sure that everyone began to hear the good news. First of all, with the people of Israel. And that part can bother you if you hear that passage, but he started with the people who, who were his people. He was raised Jewish. He began to share that, and he knew that the gospel was going to go out from there. But he began with the people, and he wanted those people who had been God's people for so long to respond to that call. Jesus came, though, and hear this if you hear nothing else today. Jesus came because God cares about you and me. And my friends, that is wonderful news. Additionally, Jesus showed his caring by, by healing people, by feeling, uh, feeding people. He went to the synagogues, as was his custom, it says in the scriptures. He went to worship. He went to teach because people needed to hear. There were people searching for the answers. Our world really needs to know that God cares about us. And we've got to be, I'm going to keep emphasizing that and emphasizing that today because it's so important for us to hear it. Our sinful world needs to hear the good news of hope. And Jesus did care. You know, he didn't just come so that he would increase the people who pray to him. Jesus came because he cares about us. You know, there are a lot of people searching for the essential answers to life's persistent questions, as the radio program says. Why am I here? What's my purpose here on this earth? And how do I find the answers when I don't know them? I thought about that, and I, I love the fact that Jesus cares about the lost. Not only lost in, in sin, but lost because they just don't understand what the world is about. They don't get it. They're confused. They're misguided. And Jesus' heart was filled with pity for them. And his motivation was because the people were worried and helpless or hassled and helpless. Like sheep without a shepherd. They didn't know where to go. And so his heart goes out to these people, these crowds of people, in each of all the towns that he was going to. The people needed guidance, they needed a focus, and they needed a purpose. And he knew that they had not found it yet. The word here, and it's, it's an interesting study. I won't go in too far into the Greek. I'm not great on pronouncing it anyway. But the words here where Jesus was caring for them because they were uh, worried and helpless, it said in the translation that I read. Another translation is that they were harassed. And the word here, harassed or worried, is the word which is a very strong word. It meant 
those who were mangled, those who were torn apart, those who were cut to the bone. That's a much stronger word, isn't it? Jesus was caring for these people because they were hurting. They were hurting emotionally. They were hurting physically. They were hurting in different ways. And then the other word, helpless, the word helpless was a stronger word than just they can't do anything. This was a word for being knocked to the ground. For example, when you've been injured or you've been drunk, just completely flat down and out. This was the word. The strength of these words is much more than harassed and helpless, you know, or worried and helpless. It's much deeper than that. This was the depth of Christ's feeling and caring for his people. And we must always remember that Christianity is not for discouraging people, but it's for encouraging people. It's not to weigh people down with burdens, but to lift people up with wings. God in Jesus did not ignore a hurting world. And I want you to hear that. Jesus didn't ignore the hurting world. People need to know that God cares for us. And we need to be good shepherds like Jesus. Our mission is Jesus' mission. More importantly, Jesus' mission is our mission. We need to guide a world full of lost people. The next thing I want us to share is that uh, is our mission. Jesus called these 12 apostles. He called them and he wanted them to go on this mission and go to these different towns just like he had been doing. He sent them out in pairs, we find out in another passage. J. Oswald Sanders says in his book, What of the Unevangelized, he comments, it is a commentary on our fallen nature that we are so easily moved in the presence of physical need or peril or suffering and yet so indifferent to the spiritual needs of the very same people. Here's the example he gives. An Egyptian woman, upon hearing the gospel for the first time, said, that's a wonderful story. Do the women in your country believe it? She said, I don't think they can believe it, or they would not have been so long coming to us. The harvest is large. Billions of people do not know Christ, do not know the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Statistics are that even in our country, half the people in our community don't even claim to be Christian. And those who do claim to be Christian, only 19% consider it essential to worship and serve God. Uh, and on an average Sunday, only one in five Americans are in worship, maybe a little less than that. The harvest is large. The need is there. Church attendance, obviously, isn't the only thing we're talking about, but it's a way in which we measure. It's a way in which we understand the dedication of the disciples of Jesus Christ. There are a lot of people hungering to know what we know, and we need to share it. Did you know that 56% of California farmers have not been able to find enough workers to pick the fruits and vegetables that they have for the last five years. Not just this year, for the last five years, they've not been able to find enough people. And since these foods have a short window where you can pick them and process them and get them to market, the number of workers needed is not a very flexible number. And so one of the problems we have is that there are not enough workers to pick the food that we have around us. We see that, and we also have seen on the news lately, haven't we, where the milk has been poured out and the vegetables have been plowed under in the fields because, one, there isn't a market for all the product that is there because the schools have been closed and the restaurants have been closed. And even as we open back up, some of those things take a while to grow. They don't just grow immediately. And as we see this, it was beyond that, even though some of the farmers would have gladly given it to food banks and to the hungry people that we have seen around, they weren't able to do it because there weren't enough volunteers. They couldn't afford to pay people to come and pick them. But if they had gotten the volunteers, they could have given it to them. But they were losing half their crops, half their product. We need more volunteers 
not only practically in our world, but we certainly need it in a more practical way in the spiritual needs. You see, few people dislike wasting food more than I do. I just don't like to see it wasted. But I am more concerned that people are being wasted in our world because we have not reached out to them and met those spiritual hungers that are there in all people. Jesus called the disciples and the scripture says that they left their lives and they followed Jesus. And the word disciple here is a word that means a student or a follower. And Jesus was unique in that he called people from all parts of life, uneducated fishermen, tax collectors, zealots, patriots, people that are out there from all different parts of life. You know, in a way, don't you see that? You know, rabbis went and called their disciples. If, if the rabbi was looking for the people that were normally called, Peter and James and John and Andrew wouldn't have been called, probably. And don't you know that's one reason why they left to be able to follow Jesus and leave their nets and follow him? Jesus called all kinds of people. And so because of that, I believe we all have a chance to be called. No matter who we are, no matter what our name is, no matter what we think our abilities are, God has a place for us in his kingdom. Most of us have experienced, though, in our organizations that we're around the 80-20 principle, you know, where 20% of the people do 80% of the work or, you know, a lot, a whole bunch of the work. The percentage is not the way it should be. In, in most organizations. The church has suffered from that in the times past, but it's the place where it shouldn't. The church should not suffer like that. But we should be 100% dedicated to the cause of Christ. All of us should be finding our place to serve. It's an important message. It's an important message for us to share. It is God's desire that everyone should come back to him, and we need to feel and care about the lost world the way that Jesus did. Our mission is to be like Jesus' mission. You see, the church can get sidetracked sometimes. We want more people in the church. I've never, I've met very few churches that didn't want to grow. They wanted to grow. They wanted more people to be there. They wanted more people to show up so it looked popular, so it wouldn't die, so that they would give their money, so that it could continue to exist. All of those things are very practical concerns, and we get it, and we have to deal with it. But the other thing I thought about, when I thought about this, I thought Jesus' Sermon on the Mount phrase where he says, we need to seek the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added unto us. The church needs to grow so that we have more disciples, so that we can go out and share the gospel the good news with our families and friends and our community and our world. That's why we need to grow. The other parts just come. The other parts just come because where our treasure is, where our hearts are, that's where our treasure will be as well. People really do need the Lord. We sing that from time to time in this service, but people do need the Lord. We share because Jesus shared with us. Verse 8 says it this way, You have received without paying, so give without being paid. So are we going to be the kind of disciples who care about the harassed and the hurting and the helpless in our world? When I see the unrest in our world, the protests, the injustices, the prejudice, the harsh words, the people who take advantage of the hurting, the disrespect, the insults, the looting, I see all of this and I begin to believe that Jesus is looking on it with pity just as he did the day that it's quoted here. On the worried and the helpless world of people that are out there. I believe he wants us to listen to the teaching, his teaching, to hear the good news. And I think he wants this message of forgiveness of sin to go out to a world to care for the souls of others the way that he did. We need to walk across the room or step out. Whatever the program is that works for you is fine with me, but what it comes down to is what has God done for us? That's what we share with others. We don't have to be wonderful at speaking. All we have to do is wonderful at sharing. We 
need to be more than observers of the Christian faith. We need to be active disciples helping as Jesus did. And no matter your name or your title or your place in this world, God has a place for you in his church. God cares about those of us who have been harassed and hassled and helpless. And this is obvious because Jesus came and that's what he did. He did not have idle words and only taught. Jesus put his faith into action. And he had a mission. And his mission needs to be our mission. Can you imagine how much better our world would be? Just think about it. How much better our world would be and how many problems would be solved if more and more people understood the good news of Jesus Christ. You and I have a good job to do. It's wonderful that we have been entrusted with the gospel and sharing it. How, what a great gift that is. What a great trust it is that God has given to his people. We have a needed message for a hurting world. And we can share it. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. We thank you, God, that you have been patient with us, that you have been forgiving, that you have been loving, most of all, that you've been caring, and that you have shown us what you want us to do. We pray that we would respond, and as that continues to change, as you call us to different works, if you call us to different projects, we may, may we always remember the mission that you have given us that we would live like Jesus lived, that we would share what Jesus shared. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, God gives us many opportunities in this life, a chance to serve him in a church, to, to become a part of the family of God, to give our lives to Christ. God gives us a chance, and I think that perhaps the greatest need is for us to rededicate our lives to what it is we already know to do, but we haven't been doing. Perhaps God is speaking to you in another way. Perhaps as God is calling you to some, some different kind of ministry. The opportunity is yours as we stand together and sing.
session, our deacons meet here in a few minutes, and then our session meets Tuesday night. We've got other things coming up in the days ahead, and I hope that uh, you will be where you need to be. Be in prayer, whether you can be here or not. Uh, be in prayer for what we are doing and for those who are able to do it. Now receive God's blessing. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God our Heavenly Father, the power and presence of His Holy Spirit, be with you now and forever. Amen. Thank you.